Hey everyone, it took NVIDIA 10 years to finalize the real-time ray tracing technology found within the new GeForce RTX cards, but alas, reviewers were given just five days to review what is genuinely next-generation graphics hardware. Now, I hope to cover off as much as I possibly can here, but bear with me if it's not a complete review as you would have liked. But what I can show you today is just how powerful the new RTX cards in relation to their predecessors and give you an inkling of what the new Turing architecture delivers. And it is only an inkling. Turing offers real-time ray-tracing technology and potentially game-changing performance-enhancing image reconstruction techniques, but right now there are no games on the market that use them, which makes testing them very difficult indeed. At the very least though, I can give you some first impressions of the new hardware. Firstly, we're testing the Founders Editions cards here, which sees Nvidia move away from its traditional blower design in favour of a thermal solution more in keeping with some of the third-party products you see out there. Dual axial fans propel air into your case as opposed to out of the back of it, while the fans themselves are obviously quieter than previous NVIDIA cards. The end result, a quieter card obviously, and a cooler one as well. So yeah, there's a genuine sense of quality, weight and heft to both RTX 2080 and 2080 Ti, both of which share a nigh-on identical chassis, the only visible difference between them coming down to an 8 plus 8 pin PCI power input configuration on the Ti versus 8 plus 6 on the standard RTX 2080. Display inputs are an evolution from that seen on the 1080 Ti. Once again, Dual Link DVI has been consigned to oblivion, but HDMI 2.0 remains while there are three DisplayPort outputs in addition to USB-C featuring Virtual Link, a new protocol designed to reduce the VR headset's cable nightmare into one easy to handle lead. Charging extra cash for the Pascal Founders editions always rankled, but at least this time the price premium is matched by the quality of the chassis and Nvidia also adds a reasonable factory overclock on top. At the silicon level then, Turing represents a considerable gamble by Nvidia. Real-time ray tracing technology and the deep learning tensor cores add significantly to the size of the core processor, which in turn translates into a much higher base cost. The TU-102 processor found in the top-end 2080 Ti 60% larger than its predecessor, while the 2080's TU-104 sees a remarkable 74% increase in die area. Now combine that with the cutting-edge GDDR6 memory, not to mention the complete lack of competition in the market, and this possibly explains the high prices. RTX 2080 costs more than 1080 Ti, and well, the 2080 Ti is charged at Titan money. With the upcoming fire sales of GTX 1080 Ti as retailers clear stock, many may be tempted by a good deal on the Pascal range. So just how profound are Turing's key features? Real-time ray tracing is considered, of course, the holy grail of 3D rendering, and we've seen some remarkable results on the RTX 2080 Ti, but there are a number of caveats that need to be factored in. First of all, Right now, obviously, there's a real lack of software and we're unlikely to see anything until further into Q4. We should expect to see Battlefield 5 here as the big showcase and what we've seen of it so far looks quite beautiful with real-time reflections beyond anything we've seen before. Similarly, 4A Games' Metro Exodus reveals how ray tracing can revolutionise global illumination. Again, it's a stunning showcase. But there are three elements to understand here in the short term. Firstly, developers have only had limited access to final Turing hardware. The Battlefield 5 demo we played saw the developers only enjoying the benefit of access to final hardware in the two weeks leading up to Gamescom, the rest of development spent using older boards based on Volta architecture. In short, we're just at the beginning here. Secondly, performance is a concern. Battlefield 5 runs at 1080p north of 60 frames per second with ray tracing enabled on the top-end 2080 Ti. If you're spending over a thousand pounds or dollars or whatever on a graphics card, is 1080p really gonna cut it? Similarly, Metro Exodus's 
Gamescom demo drops beneath 1080p60. Optimization is sure to follow and as we shall see, Turing has more tricks up its sleeve to get the job done. But all of this optimization is going to take time. The final factor to consider is that everything we've seen so far has been running on RTX 2080Ti, so where does that leave the less capable 2080 and 2070? Right now, we don't know, but maybe other Turing technologies can help boost performance. Technologies like DLSS, for example, deep learning supersampling. The point is that Turing's architecture is so forward-looking it contains features that nobody has really begun to tap into yet, which means that if you buy now, you kind of need to wait to see those advantages. So there's a lot of jam tomorrow here, but one feature we can take a closer look at is indeed DLSS. Again, there are no shipping titles using it at launch, but we have access to two demos that show that it may well be a game changer. Now, John, Alex and I will be talking in more depth about this in a separate video, but performance is the focus in this one. At the most fundamental level, a lower resolution image is generated and then a deep learning algorithm programmatically upscales the image based on learnt behavior sourced by NVIDIA's Saturn V supercomputer, studying extreme resolution game imagery, finding patterns in their composition and building it all into a reconstruction algorithm just a few megabytes in size. The bottom line is this, if the actual image being generated is of a lower resolution, it stands to reason that shading power decreases, resulting in higher frame rates. So think of this as checkerboarding with fewer of those telltale artifacts. But again, I don't really think that gives it all the credit it deserves. But anyway, so begins the benchmarking. And we'll begin by taking a look at Epic's Infiltrator demo. On the new cards, we're able to use DLSS as well as the standard TAA, while the older Pascal flagships, 1080 and the TI, are limited to standard TAA only. The data is clear enough here and gives potential RTX 2080 buyers, in particular, food for thought. The 1080 Ti remains an outstanding performer that can match and sometimes beat the 2080. It has more memory, and it's likely to get plenty of tempting cut price deals in the short term. However, the 2080 here is almost 12% faster in this bench. However, with DLSS active, that 12% lead rises to 58%. That is pretty impressive, and it's on par with the kind of performance boosts we saw between 9 series and 10 series cards, and places a clear divide between Turing and Pascal products. Even without DLSS, the 2080 offers a 41% performance boost over its notional predecessor, the GTX 1080, and this increases to a full doubling of performance once the reconstruction technique is enabled. Fascinating stuff. Also intriguing is that running with DLSS enabled allows the RTX 2080 to beat off the challenge of the 2080 Ti when it doesn't have DLSS enabled. In this case, that gives the lower end card a 13.5% lead. But obviously, the 2080 Ti is equipped with the same technology and up against the GTX 1080 Ti, it's 39% faster with the like-for-like -like TAA enabled, rising to an impressive 95% boost once DLSS is factored into the equation. In our general gameplay testing, we found that the RTX 2080 Ti is a phenomenal 4K performer, just relying on standard rasterization performance. But DLSS takes things into a whole new category and image quality is really decent. Again, this is something that we'll cover in depth shortly. But again, this is a demo, not a game. However, we also have a Final Fantasy XV demo to look at. This is a great game, but its standalone benchmarking tool, as seen here, is remarkably poor, with often terrible performance, especially when Gameworks is enabled. We were given a version of the demo with settings locked seemingly to max, yes, with Gameworks, and performance was okay, but marred by obvious stuttering. For our benchmark, we capture three stages of the bench where the stuttering is kept to a minimum. The idea here isn't to test Final Fantasy XV as a game with these GPUs, but rather to judge relative performance with the same workloads from areas that run fairly smoothly, with DLSS enabled and disabled. 
2080 performance with standard TAA reveals that the card enjoys a straight 30% lead over GTX 1080 and it's basically on par with a TI, a state of affairs that's fairly common in the standard benchmarks to come. DLSS grants the RTX 2080 a further 39.5% of raw performance, which clearly takes it well beyond the capabilities of even the most powerful Pascal cards. With DLSS active, the RTX 2080 offers an 81% boost over the 1080. With 2080 results this good, the impact on the TI is even more profound. Again, with DLSS active, it's capable of delivering 80% more performance than the 1080 Ti, which, you know, come on, that's pretty awesome. With 28 games confirmed for DLSS support, it's clear there is momentum behind adopting this technology. It requires a game engine that already uses temporal anti-aliasing, which is basically most of them these days, and according to NVIDIA, integration is fairly simple. Now, if we're getting a 40% performance uplift, the implications are clear here for ray tracing, an area where low frame rates are concerning a lot of potential users, as I mentioned earlier. So here's an example of its application at work here in the Star Wars Reflection demo. Bear in mind that up until the release of Turing, it took four Volta cards running in parallel to render this at 1080p24. Here we're running the demos unlocked at 1440p with DLSS on both cards. The RTX 2080 Ti has the processing power and the memory to operate at 2160p, 4K, using DLSS. And although frame rates are a lot lower, it is doing so consistently above the 24 FPS design threshold. This gives you some idea not only of how ray tracing capabilities scale between the two RTX cards, but also how instrumental DLSS could be in getting frame rates and maybe resolutions higher when RT features are enabled. So, we've covered some examples of how the Turing architecture aims to improve quality and performance through new and enhanced features, but the fact is that in many ways, that's all about the future of gaming technology. So what about the present and indeed the past? There's been a lot of concern, obviously, about the lack of performance numbers in the run-up to the RTX launch. Has Nvidia spent too much of its time on new features that may or may not be utilized? Has ray tracing and DLSS come at the expense of standard rasterized 3D performance? To answer this question, we've put together a revised suite of benchmarks, a mixture of old favorites and newcomers based on the most modern rendering techniques. Owing to time pressures, we've limited our results to 4K performance only. We did carry out some testing on lower resolutions, but really none of these cards should be considered for anything other than 1440p gaming or higher. We'll kick off with one of Digital Foundry's classic favorites, Assassin's Creed Unity. It's a title that vacuums up both compute and VRAM, not to mention memory bandwidth when its depth of field effect kicks in during cutscenes. The results overall are clear cut. RTX 2080 does a remarkable job of mimicking the throughput of the outgoing 1080 Ti. It's very slightly slower overall on averages, but improves on its lowest 1% figures. Meanwhile, the RTX 2080 Ti immediately presents its credentials, delivering a solid 30% chunk of extra performance over both GTX 1080 Ti and RTX 2080. Playing this beautiful game on top tier RTX hardware on a 4K display, quite the experience. Next up, it's time to take a look at Battlefield 1 on DX12, running a small section of campaign gameplay at ultra settings. There is no canned benchmark on this title, meaning that there can be some variance on a per run basis. However, the trend is clear enough. Turing seems to get the most performance out of the most modern rendering architectures, and this can be seen here as the RTX 2080 enjoys a solid 10% lead in frame rates over the GTX 1080 Ti. Gen versus Gen, and that's assuming you consider the 2080 a 1080 successor, bearing in mind the extra money being charged for it. Well, the bottom line is that Turing delivers a solid 32% improvement. Once again, 2080 Ti <laughs> delivers suitably monstrous results. A clear 41% boost in performance compared to GTX 1080 Ti. And it's just over 28% faster than 2080, further solidifying the Ti's GPU King reputation. Crisis 3 is another oldie but goodie, and it's always the first game I load up whenever a new graphics card arrives. 
Why? Well, first of all, we know of its various characteristics in stressing every part of a new GPU. Secondly, while the game may be over five years old now, as display resolutions have scaled over time, Crytek's shooter continues to provide a stern challenge to any kind of hardware that's thrown at it. This game is supremely challenging to GPU hardware at 4K resolution and has a particular habit of revealing specific weaknesses in new GPU technology. And in this case, it's showing that the existing 1080 Ti can actually beat RTX 2080 by a small but significant margin in some tasks with the Pascal chip delivering a 4.8% advantage overall. This appears to be an architectural issue as the percentage differential with RTX 2080 eats into the performance bump delivered by 2080 Ti, which posts a 25% increase over its predecessor. Far Cry 5 next, a new game in our benchmark suite and a significant one. First of all, I did note that this game's reliance on single core performance means that the RTX 2080 Ti can be bottlenecked at 1440p resolution, even with an 8700K. Once again, the 2080 reveals that its general performance level is very similar indeed to 1080 Ti. And remember that the lead it commands here may well vanish once cards running at reference clocks appear. After all, remember that the Founders Editions cards do get factory overclocks this time around. On the flip side, it's worth pointing out that Turing features hardware level HDR tone mapping, something that Pascal does not possess meaning that if you are playing this one on a high dynamic range display, the RTX 2080 should pull ahead. Meanwhile, it's business as usual with the RTX 2080 Ti. There's a 29.5% performance increase over the 2080, a performance differential that increases to 33% up against the 1080 Ti. Let's continue now with Ghost Recon's Wildland from Ubisoft. Run this game on its default high setting and it's an eminently agreeable experience <laughs> across a range of PC hardware. However, dip into the quality settings, move to the ultra preset and suddenly the game transforms into one of the most challenging graphics workouts we've ever seen and where even GTX 1080 Ti can only deliver an anemic 37 FPS at 4K resolution. This remarkably low level of performance persists into the RTX era. Once again, RTX 2080 hands in a small uptick in performance over 1080 Ti, though there is a creditable 30% jump over its predecessor, GTX 1080. The RTX 2080 Ti remains the king of the hill, but the crippling workout induced by this title on this extreme preset ensures that we get a subpar boost of just 22%. But yeah, I would consider this one an outlier. Next up, the freshly minted Shadow the Tomb Raider. First of all, congrats to developer Nixis for the very special nature of this PC port. The DX12 implementation is stunning and CPU utilization is phenomenal. And it's one of the very few games where running at 1080p doesn't necessarily leave you struggling with CPU stutter. It's also highly friendly to Ryzen processors as well. At the lower end, GTX 1080 and Vega 64 offer essentially equivalent experiences, but similar to Battlefield 1, RTX 2080 is able to push ahead of the classic 1080 Ti, delivering a 9% improvement to overall performance, and that's consistent from start to finish. Meanwhile, gen on gen, RTX 2080 offers up a 38% uplift in frame rates over the GTX 1080. The increase in performance on RTX 2080 Ti is similarly impressive, with a clear 39% improvement in like-for-like -like testing against 1080 Ti, while the bump to frame rates is at the 27% mark compared to RTX 2080. Of course, Nixis isn't finished with Shadow, not by a long shot. RTX Ray Trace Shadow support is incoming, but perhaps more exciting is the arrival of DLSS. Now, performance is really good here already, and it should be phenomenal once deep learning super sampling is added to the mix. Next up, we love our Witcher 3 benchmark, a run through the grounds of Novigrad City on horseback. It stresses CPU, GPU, memory bandwidth, and even storage if your frame rates go high enough. Everything is run at ultra settings, but we disable Nvidia Hairworks, which doesn't really provide enough of a visual upgrade to warrant its mammoth GPU costs. 
So, there are some good results here with RTX 2080 delivering a solid 5% increase in performance over the GTX 1080 Ti, which in turn means that the 2080 Ti delivers a really decent 37% of additional throughput. Our final benchmark test game is a really good one. Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus running under id Tech 6 on the Vulcan API. To say this game is a performance monster is not an understatement. Stretches of gameplay at 4K Uber settings on the RTX 2080 Ti can play out in excess of 120 frames per second. There's no canned benchmark run for this one, so we choose a dash through the battle-torn streets of New Orleans to put this game through its paces. RTX takes this to the next level and highlights how more modern game engines sing on the Turing architecture. 2080 posts its biggest increase over 1080 Ti to date, delivering a 17% uptick in performance. Compared to the GTX 1080, that boost zips up to a remarkable 48%. In the here and now, RTX 2080 is very much a similar product in standard 3D performance to GTX 1080 Ti. But maybe this highlights the state of performance improvements to come. Now, what's all the more remarkable here is that I'm told that the current build of Wolf 2 does not include the Turing-specific variable rate shading optimizations we saw during NVIDIA's press day during Gamescom. So there may be further improvements to come, all of which bodes well for RTX 2080 Ti. It's already phenomenal here, posting a 50% improvement in frame rates over GTX 1080 Ti. So what's the score here? Turing represents the biggest shift in PC graphics technology we've seen for a long time, possibly even stretching back to the arrival of GeForce 3 architecture back in the day. There is much in common here, specifically more of a focus on introducing new features, dedicating precious silicon die space to amazing stuff like real-time ray tracing acceleration and deep learning, as opposed to just piling on more CUDA cores. And you know, this was always an option for Nvidia, and it would undoubtedly have led to bigger performance increases in standard 3D gaming and possibly lower prices. But fundamentally, it would be more of the same, another product defined by how much faster it is than its predecessor, as opposed to delivering something genuinely new and forward-looking. Turing represents a new vision for gaming technology, one that allies closely with Nvidia's aspirations in data center processing and the automotive markets. Now, on the face of it, there's little need for Turing's deep learning tensor cores to be part of a GeForce product. However, the arrival of DLSS seems to address the relevancy of the tensor cores by providing what looks like a killer feature. We're still waiting for actual games to test, but based on the two demos we've tried, Nvidia's take on reprojection is delivering 35 to 40% of additional performance, and that's a crucial component in setting apart the RTX 2080 from the GTX 1080 Ti, which still holds up remarkably well in standard 3D gaming. But in the here and now, there is the sense that a lot of what Turing offers will only manifest in the future. There'll be no Raid Face games available at the RTX launch. A couple of demos if we're lucky, and even DLSS gaming may take a little time to arrive. So in that sense, it's perfectly understandable if you decide to hold back on a purchase for now. That said, we fully understand that this may well prove challenging when GTX 1080 Ti remains competitive in traditional 3D rendering and when prices on that card may well tumble. When RTX pricing already looks extreme, a cut price 1080 Ti could just prove too tempting. And pricing clearly is the biggest issue here. But equally, the cost of making the product has clearly risen significantly just in terms of die size alone before we factor in the G6 memory and the much higher quality chassis and thermal solution. And this also takes place in an era where flagship phones regularly see price increases and even Xbox One X pushed the envelope uncomfortably in terms of its price point. The bottom line is that the pace of technological evolution is slowing down and prices generally are rising. And obviously the lack of competition in the GPU space clearly isn't helping. Deciding whether to invest so much money in a high-end GPU requires careful thought then. What I can say is that in the short term, Pascal products are still superb and the potential of Turing is only just beginning to be tapped into. 
Questions remain over the take-up of key features, but I suspect we'll be a lot more knowledgeable about raid facing and DLSS support within the next few months. In the here and now, the pricing is clearly going to be a sticking point for many, but the fact is that Nvidia is the first firm to step up with a vision for the future of gaming technology, producing results that nothing on the market can copy. So anyway, I hope you really enjoyed this video, and as always, do like and subscribe to support our work, and ring the bell if subbed for instant notifications when a new video drops. And yes, please do consider the DF Patreon to support the team and to get access to some exclusive goodies. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.